Alright, hi students. Uh, welcome to this particular lesson. It's actually on the starting part of this chapter called Nutrition Humans. Now, this Nutrition Humans is what you're used to in lower sec as the human digestive system. But this time we are going to talk a lot more about what are the key structures that you should think of. So in this chapter, maybe the first question that we need to ask ourselves is that why is there even a need for us to consume food or drinks? Why is there even a need to eat or drink? Because at the end of the day, right, whatever we eat will still come out as this, which is just feces. Right. So it seems like there's no real purpose to consumption. But if you think about it for a second, humans all have to consume food and all in fact all organisms need to do that. And the purpose is for energy, for growth, and for repair. So with that, let's go on to the first part of this entire chapter. Where we're gonna explore what are some of the processes that involve in nutrition. We're also gonna see how we can label different parts of the elementary canal as well as the associated organs that's related to it. And last but not least, we'll go through this process that what exactly is called peristalsis. Now, peristalsis is a new term for you guys. So to begin with, let's give a bit of definition to nutrition. Nutrition refers to the process whereby the organisms obtain food and energy for growth, repair, as well as the maintenance of the body. Um, basically, it means that whatever we take into our body must be able to be used for purposeful functions. So nutrition actually involves five different processes. The first and foremost is actually what I call ingestion. Ingestion is the taking in of food, which basically means that you eat lah, okay? So after you eat the food, naturally the food should pass down the entire elementary canal. So as it passes down the elementary canal, there will be certain processes that happens at different parts of the elementary canal. So the main one that we are most interested in is digestion. Digestion is a process whereby larger food substances are broken down into smaller ones, and this itself is actually a process that involves uh, enzymes, okay? the one that you learned in the previous chapter. So your enzymes right, plays a big role in the entire digestion process. Then the other processes that happen is adsorption as well as assimilation. Now absorption by definition means that you take in something. Okay? Assimilation, to make it more uh, obvious to you, basically you are trying to use nutrients For certain functions okay what could be the functions for instance it could be for growth for instance it could be for energy so that is your absorption and assimilation the next last process is called ingestion in ingestion itself right this is where food the undigested food is actually removed from the entire body it is the part whereby we know that if you go to the toilet right the waste that you produce is what we call the feces okay so that's for your ingestion process the digestive system actually consists of a set of organs that is under what I call the elementary canal and together with it, there are some other organs that I call the associate organs. So let me give you a bit of run through. Uh. Basically, you are very used to knowing that when food enters the digestive system, it enters from the mouth. It will pass through this, which we call the esophagus, and it will enter the stomach before it moves on to the small intestine. And eventually, you will enter the large intestines before it gets passed out as feces. But what you realize is that more, so, more important than that, there are certain organs here. This uh, one that looks like a leaf that's attached to the elementary canal. The big structure at the back, which is related to the uh, elementary canal. As well as these yellow structures over here. Now these that I pointed out are what I call associated organs. So they're actually not part of the elementary canal. But they are also part of the human digestive system. So remember that a system right, refers to many different organs. Okay, So there can be more than one organ in this entire structure so many different organs serving a particular function right so what exactly are these are some of these structures the first one that i want to point out to you is what i call the salivary glands okay we'll be going in depth to look at what each of them do okay but just take note for now that this is salivary glands of course you have your mouth now this space at the back of the mouth okay this space over here is actually what i call the pharynx okay we'll talk a bit about it okay, but not too much then there's this structure called the esophagus now for esophagus, I just want to point out, uh, please take note of the spelling, okay? Because esophagus itself, the O is actually silent, the first O, okay? So you have your stomach, but with your stomach comes the liver at the back, which is an associated organ, the gallbladder, represented by this uh, green structure, as well as this structure that looks like a leaf, which I call it the pancreas. Now you will notice that all these three boxes here, they are in yellow, are actually the associated organs. They are not part of the elementary canal, but they are belonging to the human digestive system. And of course, at the end of the day, you have a large intestine, small intestines, the rectum, and so on and so forth. Okay, so let's go 
part by part, starting from the entry point, which is the mouth. Okay, your mouth, right, is where there's an ingestion of food taking place. Basically, you eat or whatever food that you consume must enter through the mouth. And digestion in the mouth actually requires the help of the teeth, the tongue, as well as the salivary glands. So inside your mouth, right, if you open up your mouth now, what we call the buccal cavity, okay? So it's this space that's inside your mouth itself. Okay, so the opening inside your mouth is what we call the buccal cavity. Digestion here takes place with the help of teeth, tongue, as well as salivary gland. The pharynx is actually this space that's at the back of the mouth. Okay, so if your mouth is over here, this entire muscle over here is the tongue. This space inside is the buccal cavity. Okay, when the food enters in, you pass through this space at the back, which is called the pharynx. Okay, so this is just an empty space that's connecting the buccal cavity as well as the esophagus, which is the next part. Now the esophagus, okay, the esophagus right is a narrow muscular tube that extends from the that extends to the stomach. So it's the tube that connects from the mouth area all the way to the stomach. Now it's good to take note that because it's a muscular tube, right? So you measure a pipe. The pipe always have this outer surface on it. Okay, so imagine that it's called a wall. Okay, so this entire structure is the wall of the esophagus. Okay, so imagine this one whole long tube. Okay, and we're just looking at one section of it. If you examine the wall itself, you realize that there are actually two layers of muscles, one over here and one over here, and it surrounds the entire uh, esophagus as a tube, lah, so as a ring. Okay, so basically that's what I call the longitudinal muscles and what I call the circular muscles. Okay, we'll talk more about this thing when we talk about peristalsis later on. Yeah, but just to know that there's actually two layers of muscles inside the entire esophagus. Next, the stomach. Now the stomach is a stretchable muscular bag. So it's basically, imagine a balloon that has the elasticity for it to stretch. That's why when you consume a lot of food, right, sometimes you feel very bloated. Okay, but what's interesting about stomach is that it consists of many what we call gastric glands. If you'll be able to use a microscope to examine the internal structure of a stomach, right, you realize that there's a lot of this kind of um, uh, component, which I call the gastric glands. So this entire thing is like the gastric glands over here. And what it does is it actually release out what I call gastric juice. Okay, so in the gastric juice, you'll realize that it consists of two things. Okay, one of it is hydrochloric acid. Secondly, it's actually a set of enzymes. Now, these two combinations will allow for a certain kind of digestion to happen inside the stomach. So inside the gastric juice, there's hydrochloric acid as well as there's an enzyme. Okay, next, after the stomach, that's where the food passes on to the small intestine. Now, in the small intestine itself, food will enter through the uh, starting point and you'll be able to exit over here to the large intestine. And what is important to take note over here is that um, the small intestine can actually be segmented in different parts. Okay, we call it the duodenum and jejun jejunum as well as the ileum. So what does it look like? Basically, if you think of the entire system in this manner, duodenum will refer to the front part over here, the first part that connects to the stomach. The entire middle part is actually the jejunum. Okay, and the ending part is the ileum. Now, why do we give them different terms? Because actually they serve different functions. Lah. Okay, some of them are more involved in digestion some of them are more involved in absorption yeah so later on we go on to this part on the small intestine we also elaborate a bit more on that basically the small intestine the wall itself also releases enzymes and the enzymes will help in the digestion itself and it's about six meter long in, an, in a grown adult okay now after the small intestine that's where you go to the large intestine colon forms the bulk of the entire large intestine okay and it's ended off with the rectum in the end as well as the anus so basically, the large intestine is about 1.5 meter long in an adult, and undigested food will be ejected out as feces. Now I'm going to talk about the separate organs like this one, the gallbladder, pancreas, liver, and also maybe the salivary gland. These are what I call the associated organs. Okay, so they are associated to the alimentary canal itself. So these are the three main associated organs that you need to know, the liver, the gallbladder, and pancreas. They also help in the digestion of food, but they may or may not have, uh, they may or may not release enzymes. Okay, so you need to understand what each of them do later on. The liver actually releases this thing called bowel. Okay, this is uh, quite a crucial chemical that you need to take note of, but we'll talk about this later on. The gallbladder stores bowel. Now, one of it is to store the bowel, 
one of it is to secret secret means to release or to produce okay so what I'm saying over here is that while the liver will be the one that produces the bowel the gallbladder is the one that stores the bowel temporarily so it stores it for a while when there's a need to release it up for the digestion process to happen it will help pancreas pancreas is the one that releases uh, pancreatic juice okay? pancreatic juice inside itself is also containing of a lot of enzymes Okay, so pancreatic juice itself contains a lot of enzymes. Let's do a quick short quiz so that you can at least uh, test yourself on how, whether you remember how, what I've been going through so far. So basically, I want you to list down in the order of the different regions of the elementary canal that a food will actually pass through upon ingestion. Now, a hint for you is that I want you to link for me the regions of the elementary canal. So to give you an example, right, we always start with the mouth. Okay. If actually you pass through some stuff, some stuff, so and so forth. But the trick over here is that there are some traps, just some unnecessary or organs that's given over here. So there's no need for you to use everything. Okay, use whatever you think is required in the elementary canal itself. The rest of it, uh, just put it aside. Okay, so you need to understand where will food pass through as you go through the digestive system. So. How does food actually move through the entire human digestive system? And this is the part that we will actually be spending a lot of time to understand how food actually moves through. Because if you think about it for a second, it's not really possible for food that you consume over here to just drop down by gravity and then move through by itself. Because if that was the case, you can never eat while lying down. There must be some force inside that allows the food to move through the entire system. Okay, we'll take a look at a short video to understand what exactly is this force. But food doesn't just fall down the esophagus. In fact, even if we chose to eat and swallow upside down, food would still quickly make its way up to the stomach. The reason is that food is propelled through the esophagus, as well as the other parts of the digestive tract, by a series of muscular contractions called peristalsis. Peristalsis works a little like a tube of toothpaste. Squeezing the tube forces the paste out. Food moves through the digestive tract in much the same way. Muscles behind the food squeeze together, while muscles in front of the food relax. In this way, peristalsis forces food through the esophagus and other parts of the digestive tract. So as you heard from the video itself, you realize that there is a process called peristalsis. Now peristalsis is a process that allows food to move through the entire elementary canal itself. It actually is characterized by uh, what I call a rhythmic wave-like muscular contraction. Now why do I say rhythmic wave-like muscular contraction? Because number one, it involves muscles that are squeezing or relaxing to allow food to move. That's why it's called muscular contraction. Number two, it works like a wave whereby you actually have food moving where you squeeze it and you move forward and then after you squeeze it again, then the food will move forward again. So there's a repetitive movement over there and it occurs throughout the entire elementary canal. The function, number one, is to move the food along the gut. Number two, is to make sure that we can mix the food with the digestive juices. Okay, so these are two functions of peristalsis. It works similar to what this diagram is trying to show. Basically, if I were to put in a tennis ball okay, into a long sock, okay, and you're supposed to move the ball along the that sock, you have to squeeze at the end, so the ball will move forward a bit, then you squeeze forward a bit, the ball will move forward a bit, so and so forth. So that's actually how the entire uh, peristalsis process works. Okay, it's pretty much similar to what you use at home, like the toothpaste. Okay, when you want to squeeze out the toothpaste, you have to squeeze from the back. Right? When you squeeze from the back, the thing will move forward and you just repeat the entire movement until you get the entire chemical coming out. So in peristalsis, uh, this is actually made possible by what I call a pair of antagonistic muscles. Antagonistic means muscles that movement are opposite of each other. For instance, uh, okay, when one muscle contract, the other muscle must relax. If there's a structure that is contracting the muscular the muscle is actually contracting the other muscle that is with it right must actually relax if not the entire structure will snap apart okay, so this is what I call antagonistic 
muscles. So they always come in a pair, whereby they do different functions. So if you recall, just now I mentioned to you that they are what I call the longitudinal muscles and the circular muscles. And in fact, this is actually throughout the entire elementary canal. Meaning to say that it can be found in the esophagus, it can be found in the stomach, it can be found in the small intestine, it can also be found in the large intestine. So there's always these two layers of muscles that are circulating around the entire structure. And how do they function for peristalsis? Now, if you look at this entire structure, right, you realize that it's trying to show you that this is actually what I call a uh, food mass. So the food is over here. For the food to move in this particular direction, okay, if you want the food to move in this particular direction, what we need to do is that we need to make sure that we actually squeeze down this part. Okay, squeeze it tight over here so that we force the food to move forward. But as we squeeze it tight over here, we need to make sure that over here, okay, this entire structure is being relaxed so that the food can actually flow through. Squeezing action, right, in biology, we actually call it constriction. So we'll say that the wall on this part of the esophagus, for instance, will actually constrict. Okay, and the relaxing part, we actually call it dilation. So we'll say that the wall over here will actually dilate. Okay, so you see uh, uh, some certain terms that we use uh, okay, when describing the peristalsis process. How does this part constrict? Now, for this part to constrict, what must happen is that the circular muscle must contract while the longitudinal muscle will relax. Now, if you realize that they have opposite movement, okay, and the reason why they have opposite movement is because they are what I call antagonistic muscles. So, when one does something, the other one must do the opposite one. So, when one side contract, the other one must relax. Okay, and this motion will allow this part to be constricted. Okay, and then you'll be able to move the foot forward. Now, the second part over here, the dilation part. Okay, what happened over here is that the longitudinal muscle will now actually contract, but while the circular muscle will actually relax. So same thing over here, you realize that it's always opposite movement. Okay, you cannot have both contracting together at once, because if not, the muscle will snap. Okay, and this will allow the foot to enter and to enter this space. So, what happens after this? Next, so imagine this process is done. What's going to happen is that this part now will constrict and this part over here will dilate. So the foot will just move on to the other side. And this part will constrict again, whereas this part will dilate and the foot will move on to the other side, so and so forth. And that's how parasolsis is slowly how to move the foot forward. But now the problem is, wow, I've got so many things to remember. How do I even remember? Uh, this entire thing, right? I must know which one contract, which one relax, which one is constrict, dilate, so on and so forth. Now the good thing is we can actually in bio, right, use something that I call a mnemonics. So mnemonics, right? M N E O M O M O N I C S. Okay, mnemonics are actually what I use, what I call as stories to help you remember. So what I have over here in this picture, right, is two cats sitting on a car. Okay, so my question is, do cats really like cars? So it's, it's supposed to be something lame and it's supposed to be something funny, but basically using this, right, you can actually help yourself remember what exactly is going on. So how do I use these mnemonics of do cats really like cars? Look at the first alphabet of each of the word. Okay, D C R L C. Now how does this apply to this part on peristalsis? Basically, it's trying to tell you that when the muscle wall dilates, okay, what happens is that the circular we start with C. Circular muscle must relax while the longitudinal muscles will contract. Okay, so this is one way to remember. And how do you remember the other side of the description? Because remember what I mentioned just now? When when one part is going through a process of constriction, the other part must go through dilation, right? So you must remember the whole entire story. So if I'm saying that dilation means that circular muscle relax, longitudinal muscle contract. And what if the wall were to constrict, constriction of wall? Most likely, the circular muscle will be doing the opposite. Instead of relaxing, the circular muscle will contract. Longitudinal muscle will actually relax. So they actually work in opposite manner. So if you can remember one set that do cats really like cars, that the dilation of wall is because of circular muscles relaxing, longitudinal muscles contracting, you should really derive the constriction part by yourself. Alright?
Okay, and with that, we have come to the end of this first video. Okay, I know it's very tedious and it's, uh, there's a lot of content, but take some time to look through the entire video again, look through your notes. Okay, if there's anything you need to clarify, uh, just let me know, let your teachers know. Okay, but if not, you can actually proceed to con uh, complete the assignment that's been allocated to you. Alright, if not, thanks.